I'll start with the misconceptions first. So uh, there's a classic hype cycle. You know, and if you imagine the hype cycle, it starts with a big peak and then it falls into a trough and then rises up. And this peak is called the peak of inflated expectations. And one of the things with any new technology and particularly any new very disruptive technology, uh, when you hit the peak of inflated expectations, that's what leads to misconceptions where people think about maybe it can do this, maybe it can't do that, those types of things. And AI is very much in that space right now where there's a lot of talk about it, there's a lot of hyperbole about it. But what we're trying to do and our goal for the frameworks that we do, the, the, the resources that we put out there for developers to really to bust through the hype so that people can like really get hands on and really get tangible with these things. And once they do that, then they can see what's possible and what's real. And that's called falling into the trough of disillusionment, which is beautifully named. You know, so, you know, it's when you get when you bust through the hype, you become disillusioned with what you thought was previously possible but now you begin to understand what is possible. And that's when the realities can happen and you can start climbing up into what they call the plateau of productivity and when you can start building real solutions. Let me give an example of that to kind of try to illustrate it. Uh, we did some research with some doctors around a concept called diabetic retinopathy. And diabetic retinopathy is the leading cure of blindness globally. Uh, there are almost 500 million people with some form of diabetes and uh, if not treated properly, it can lead to blindness. But however, early prevention and early detection can prevent this. But to be able to do that, you need to have enough ophthalmologists to review retina scans so that you can see early, you know, if somebody is susceptible to blindness with this. And there are many countries in the world where there are shortages of doctors like that. So when you understand how AI and machine learning actually work, you can then start doing something like building a, um, an AI model that will look at images of retinas that have been pre-labeled by doctors to say, this retina is diseased, this retina is healthy, and have it figure out from the image what is the distinctive factor that says one is diseased and one is healthy. And from that, you can build a model, and that model can detect, like, it was about 97% accuracy, which was more than most ophthalmologists. Now, the goal of this, of course, isn't to replace the ophthalmologist, it's to help them to scale better. So now they can, in just a few minutes, rather than maybe hours, be able to see patients, understand patients, and screen them very, very quickly. You know, so that's all very interesting, but that's kind of um, an enhancement for what somebody can do today. But then I say, now, here's where, the, where you bust through the hype and you can get really productive, is that now, when you look at those same retinas, and you understand the records of the people who own that retina, for example, their age or their gender, you could have a computer do the same fancy pattern matching. And just from looking at a retina, we discovered, like, uh, we built a model that was 97% accurate at determining somebody's gender. Now, no human could do that looking at a retina. It's a coin flip. But there's something in the data that a computer can spot when it does that pattern matching that a human couldn't spot. And that kind of thing, opening up new scenarios like that is really what the promise of AI is all about. There's a lot of hyperbole. Once you understand how the thing works, you can start coming up with those solutions um, and meet those promises and build entirely new things that people haven't previously even thought of or may have thought was infeasible. Like it's infeasible to look at a retina and determine a person's gender or their age or things like that. But it's been made possible with this type of technology. So there's a lot of confusion between artificial intelligence and machine learning. So I, I kind of like to describe it like this, that artificial intelligence is when you make a computer react the way an intelligent living being would. Right? If I show you a picture of a cat, you think it's a cat. You don't think of it as a bunch of pixels. Right? If I show you an image of a retina, you probably guess it's a retina, but you don't think of it as a bunch of pixels. An artificially intelligent thing will react the same way as you do. It will see a picture of a cat and it will say, that's a cat. It will see a picture of a retina and it will say that's diseased or it's not diseased or it's male or female and those kind of things. So that's ultimately when we talk about artificial intelligence, when we really boil down to, you know, getting rid of the hyperbole, getting rid of the science fiction, you know, it's really, it's kind of looking at a computer and having it respond the way an intelligent being would. You know, if you see a road that's curving to the left, you're going to turn left, right? You know, if you see a road curving to the left, same kind of thing. Machine learning is now the technique of creating applications that do that. So if I go back to my retina example, machine learning would be a case of here's thousands of images of a healthy retina, here's thousands of images of a diseased retina, 
go ahead, Mr. Computer, try to figure out what is it in these pixels that make it diseased, what is it in these pixels that make it healthy, and can you come up with a way of like doing that consistently by doing that kind of pattern matching? Can you learn what it is that makes that disease, what it is that makes that um, healthy, just from looking at the pixels? It's a lot of brute force. There's a lot of smart stuff behind the brute force and guessing and that kind of thing, but that's what machine learning is. So that's ultimately how I like to think about it. Artificial intelligence, make a computer respond the way an intelligent being would. Machine learning is how you get it there. Love that question. It's my favorite part of this job. So where is it at present? We're really only getting started. You know, I'm about six years down the journey of really bringing AI to the masses. Uh, I'm bringing the the possibility to build with AI to the masses. You know, when I started this, there was a survey done that said there were 300,000 AI practitioners globally. Now there's about 15 million. Um, but one of the things is, I'm cheating a little bit with the numbers, uh, but one of the things was, how do you measure it? And, you know, when this whole thing started, the 300,000, the only way it could be measured were, this was people who had their name on a published paper that had something to do with AI. Nowadays, it's like we can actually measure practitioners who are people who are writing code using machine learning to build artificially intelligent systems. So we can see where it's going is by having that mass adoption by developers, we can then reach a critical mass of all of these new applications that can be out there to improve people's lives, to make things more efficient. And like, let me tell one story actually that I really like is um, a group of high school students in India um, and their city uh, suffered greatly from air pollution. And one of the things is like, you know what it's like, you turn on the news and it will tell you the AQI today, the air quality index, but that AQI is at a sensor station, who knows where? It could be miles away from your home and pollution can be highly localized. If you live close to a major highway or close to a major road, it's probably much more serious for you. But AQI isn't everywhere, sensors aren't everywhere. So they came up with the idea was like, what if they got a portable sensor to measure the AQI in multiple areas and they took a photograph of the sky. So they said, when the sky looks like this, this is the pollution level. When the sky looks like this, this is the pollution level. When the sky looks like this, this is the pollution level. And now what do they have? They got lots of data. They got a lot, lots of labels for that data. They have a computer do the fancy pattern matching to match the two of these to each other, wrap that in an application, put that on a mobile phone, like an iPhone or an Android phone, and now you can walk outside, point your camera at the sky, and determine the level of pollution without any kind of fancy sensors. And you know, that's the kind of thing that was built by kids, <laughs> right? So this to me is like, this is where it's going, that by opening up new scenarios that previously to build something that could do air quality or air pollution detection at scale, you needed a big company, you needed software engineers, you needed millions of dollars in investment. Now it's a bunch of kids with a phone and a camera. You know, and when they're able to do these kind of things, it's like, People being able to build new solutions and new scenarios like that that none of us could think of, that's where AI is going. And uh, that's where I'm particularly excited about it. Sure. So Vertex AI is a cloud service from Google. Um, so we like to present AI to end users in two different ways. Number one is the part that I work on is the Google AI ecosystem, which is TensorFlow. It's entirely open source. It's free. Um, there's back-end stuff that you can run it on uh, called Google Colab. If you want to train, you want to learn how to do all of these kind of things. The whole idea is to make access as wide as possible by making things free, easy to use, and you know, lower the bar of entry for people. But we also recognize that when you have an AI model that you want to commercialize, that you want to have to execute at world scale when you need it to, um, and to have all of the services that are associated with that, updating it, maintaining it, managing your data, all of those kind of things that a hosted cloud-based service would be necessary for that. And that's what Vertex AI is all about. So it, it, everything from soup to nuts for being able to build, manage, maintain, and have an AI-based model, including there's a service on there that's called a neural architecture search, where the idea is like, if you want to build an AI like I was talking about, a lot of the time you have to figure out what the neural network architecture of that would be, how many layers, what types of layers, what do they do. There's a lot of coding, there's a lot of experimentation. What a neural architecture search is, it's like you throw it a bunch of data, like say, here's my images of a cloudy sky with their labels, and it will actually go and figure out what the neural network architecture that will best execute for that data is. You know, so you don't even have to start thinking in those terms. 
you know, and it will do that for you, create that model for you, so you then can deploy that in your infrastructure. So Vertex AI is all about that, when you want to operationalize. To me, I think the best strategy is to start small, kick the tires, you know, think about a solution that, uh, the number two things, number one, think about a solution that you have already that's got lots of rules in it that might be uh, of benefit from having machine learning figure out the rules instead of you having programmers figure out the rules. Oh, then number two is think about those things that are currently infeasible for your organization to do because just the code would be too hard to write. Like, detecting a disease retina, like I mentioned, those kind of things. So I'd say, think about, there's, there's got to be a scenario in, or, in your organization for that, and what would that scenario be? And then start small, gather data, label that data, and start looking at building models for that data. There's a concept in AI called transfer learning, um, and it's a fancy sounding term, but I like to say it's like, clouding, it's like climbing on the shoulders of giants. It's where somebody has already done most of the work for you. They've built a model that does something very similar to what you want to do, and you can take 90% of that work and change a little bit of it to make it work for you. Let me give an example there. Is there's a very popular model called MobileNet, and MobileNet is a computer vision model that can recognize 1,000 different types of things. Um, it was built, as the name suggests, to run on mobile, so it's highly, highly optimized to run on a cell phone. Now, if you wanted to build a model to do something like detecting the sky for pollution, like I mentioned, instead of you trying to come up with the neural architecture all by yourself, and instead of then trying to optimize that once you've got it to run on mobile phones, you could do something called transfer learning to use MobileNet, and like, it's called cutting the head off. It sounds awful, but there's a classification head at the bottom of a model. In this case, MobileNet is designed to recognize a thousand different classes. Um, but if you were building, say, air pollution and you wanted to detect five different levels of severity, you cut the bit off the bottom that does the thousand, you replace it with your five, you retrain it, doing something called freezing the existing mobile net, so you can take advantage of all of the work and all of the learning that was done in there and come up with a model for yourself very, very quickly and very, very cheaply, maybe even free. Uh, we have an open source thing called TensorFlow Light Model Maker. Um, that comes from Google that's totally free for you to use, which will do all of that work for you. You know, things like that is where I'd recommend people start so that they can see and they can evaluate if this really is for them. To shift your paradigm, you really have to shift how you build things. So traditional programming is you have a problem that you want to solve, you express how to solve that problem using rules, and those rules you write in code. Right, so I don't know, say, um, when I open my front door, I want the light to turn yeah. on, right? You probably have a sensor on the front door. That sensor, when the door opens, detects that happening. You write a rule that says, if sensor triggered, then turn on light. Those kind of things. That's a very simple scenario. Think about a much more complex scenario than like, um, you're, you have a camera feed and it spots something and is that a crime or not? What would the rules be that you would write for that? Think about how you would write that in code. It's incredibly difficult. It's probably impossible. It's absolutely infeasible. So in situations like that, this is where the paradigm change comes, where instead of you thinking in code of how you would write the code to determine what I'm looking at, is that what I you know, want to detect? Is it a crime? Is it somebody fell over? Is it how many people are in the image? Or things like that. It becomes a case of you start with the data. And it's like, okay, it's like, here's thousands of scenes, and this is a good scene. Here's thousands of scenes, and this is a bad scene. Maybe there's too many people in the room. Maybe there's a crime happening. Maybe somebody fell over, or whatever. Um, and it's starting to pivot to thinking in those terms, getting the right data, labeling the data. And when you write code, there's a thing that engineers always have to worry about called corner cases. It's like, okay, I thought about this scenario, and I thought about that scenario, and I thought about that scenario, but what about that one? It becomes the same thing in data. Right? I have data for you know a room that looks like this, a room that looks like that. But what about somebody wants hot pink lighting in their room? You know that kind of stuff. That that'd be a corner case. So you have to start pivoting to those types of things where data first, labeling that data first, and then your code becomes instead of figuring out the rules, your code becomes about how do you design the neural network? How do you run that neural network? How do you optimize that? How do you uh, get your data into a format that's easy to train? How do you make it responsible? How do you make it fair? All of those kind of things. So there's definitely a big pivot that you need to do there.